center of mass. Pulling every point of this thing down, but if I push up in exactly the middle, it ends up pushing back and matching what's going on, okay? And so, if I want to control the stick, the best place to control it is from the middle. And if the middle is limited in its behavior, typically so is the stick. And so if I take this stick and let it hang off the edge of a table, if it goes past the midpoint, it falls, right? And if it goes to the midpoint, it's pretty safe. And I want to go this way, the way these guys are built. Okay, and so I bring this guy out because what I've done is put the marks because I'm a chicken. I didn't put the mark in the middle, I gave myself a centimeter. Okay, so instead of having 50 centimeters of wood hanging out here, I've got a mere 49. Now one reason I'm doing that is that wood's not a uniform medium. And if I've got a knot in one part or the other, it isn't quite even left to right. So I've now got, it's balanced, you know, center of mass is supported. But it's now possible to talk about this as a system. And its center of mass is not hard to find because I just move this guy out. Oh, you know what I'm supposed to I will. <laughs> this is bonus, so we didn't practice it. That, yeah. Okay. And so now I take this system and move it out. And the center of mass of this system lets me get further out, right? You can see where this is going. How far do you think this is going to go? Is it, is it conceivable that I could get a stick hanging out in space? What do you think? How many people think we could actually get a stick hanging out in space? <coughs> Uh, look at that. I've seduced you. There's no way we can get a stick all the way. So, so now, if we come out to here, look, it's balancing. What's going on? Each new combination becomes a system in itself. And remember, the second stick and the first stick. The first stick is stable on the second stick. So now, if the second stick balances, the whole thing balances, right? And so now we're out three. So we'll go out one more. Oh. So we've actually made it. In five stick or five moves, this thing is actually out past the edge of the table. Right? And we now take this system and move it. And if you notice, the mathematics of this is getting mapped out in the arc here, right? That's not a straight line. Okay? And then we can go a little further and a little further. Okay, so you can see that we've got this, the, the term diminishing, the point of diminishing returns, right? We're, we're not getting anywhere near as far with each step as we did in the beginning, but we are getting further, okay? And we go out, there's nine, and finally, there's our tenth. And so we are, what? 30 centimeters out, okay? With this stick suspended, 
There is no glue. Everything's just sitting there. Okay? You say, nah, he's lying. He's got magnets in there, doesn't he? <laughs> nah, there's nothing holding it together. Okay? So, <laughs> so we can fall apart. Alright, so, as we showed here, if the center of mass is above a supported place, it, you can balance it, right? So, as long as the center of mass is there, it becomes easy to balance things. Right? So, you can imagine if you just tried to balance a pencil on the end of your finger, it's kind of hard, right? And you might think it is harder to do something like a broom, but it's actually much, much easier because the center of mass is much higher, which means that it takes much longer for the center of mass to get to a position beyond where I can support it. If you actually switch to swords, it's even better because the hilt is so heavy. When I learned how to do this, I was balancing swords. But, <laughs> but now, so that's just that's just a circus act, right? That that it's nice and easy. Long things are easy to balance because you just have to watch the center of mass. And as long as the center of mass is above your hand, it's fine. But now the question is, where is the center of mass on this broom? Right? It was easy to find on a meter stick because it's. It's symmetrical, right? Where is the, the center, where is the balance point on this broom? All of this stick is kind of the same. The end is heavy, right? We could like, you know, try and try and try it, or we can actually try this. But that if you keep it straight, you can do this with any now, long object. You guys didn't do that ooh and ah for me. <laughs> you can do this with any long object. That if you keep it straight and you bring your hands together, your hands will meet at the center of mass. Now, this is where it gets into it. Does anyone have an idea of why? Why this happens is actually a very complex bit of physics. What is the difference between my hand's interaction on this side, where it's heavier, versus this side, where it's lighter? How does my hand interact with this material? Uh, there's less friction on the side of your hand where the more, more mass is. Less, there's more friction, right? So we know that friction is proportional to the normal force, right, which is the same as the weight. So on this side of my hand, there's more weight pushing down, so there is more friction. So it is easier for this hand to move until it gets to a point where this hand has as much weight over it as that hand, at which point the friction becomes the same. And they come together at the balancing point. center of mass shenanigans. It turns out that the center of mass of an object would like to fall at the acceleration due to gravity. And so unlike a broom, we're back to a uniform wooden object that has a center of mass that would be kind of in the middle, right? It's on a hinge. Yeah, please come in. We're expecting kind of a full house, so please be dancing your seating. So, if we let this fall, and I can do that that way, okay? Let's assume the center of mass is trying to fall at gravity. You with me? 
if this thing is falling at the acceleration due to gravity, what's going on out here? Right? But you folks have never had this experience, but those of us who went to school in the 50s and had the teacher say, you bold brazen article, put out that hand, okay? And you have to put your hand out and the teacher's going to whack you with their ruler. You quickly learn, just like a pitcher in the major leagues, that you want to be high and inside. Okay? So you get it in there so the teacher can't get much velocity, but for the fools who are out here, that ruler comes down and really whacks, right? And so if this thing's falling at the acceleration due to gravity, this is moving faster. Nothing falls faster than gravity though, right? All right, so you watch. Tell me, is that faster than gravity? Is that faster than gravity? You don't know. You're no good at all. We need a comparison. Look at that. There's something that wants to fall at the acceleration due to gravity. If we can fall fast enough, what might happen? <laughs> the cup would beat the ball down. No, that had never happened, would it? That's just, that's just silly. Thank you for coming on uh, what challenging conditions um, to give you an idea of how impressive you are. This room was empty for the first show. Nobody. Well, okay, two people came. Two very brave people, but three schools didn't come. Um, so I'm really pleased to see you. It's nice. You know, we were afraid we were all dressed up with no place to go. Um, so I am Bill Berner. My job here at Penn is that I run the demonstration laboratory for the physics department. Uh, and what you're going to see are the things that I actually get paid money to play with every day. Um, this is actually a job that people can get. Uh, there are not a lot of these jobs. Uh, but colleges and universities with physics departments that do a lot of teaching, in general have a demonstration lab and may actually hire a person to have as much fun as I do. Um, there might be about a thousand of those jobs in the country. You can see I'm getting older. There are going to be openings. Okay? So it's a possibility. Um, my uh, colleague is not going to be replaced terribly soon. Peter Harnish runs the undergraduate labs upstairs. I'll let him give you a little bit of a sense of what he does. So, while Bill does all these demonstrations that happen in the front of class, the, all the things that happen, well, that students are actually doing with their hands in laboratories, I design all that upstairs. Uh, so that ranges from, we're gonna roll a thing down a ramp with a stopwatch and doing the clicks and all that, uh, to we have a lab where you make a CAT scan machine on a desk. Oh, yeah. That's a sophomore level class here in college. Um, so we do a lot of interesting stuff and we write a bunch of that kind of stuff here. One thing I would like you to note, neither of us introduced ourselves as doctor because neither of us have PhDs and we teach at Penn. Uh, that I know a lot of people, they immediately think that if they go into a field they have to go as far as humanly possible in that field to get anywhere in the world. That is not true at all. Uh, the large majority of science that is happening, most of the brunt work is done by people without 
a bunch of letters after their names. And we do a lot of interesting stuff. So remember, going any bit further out there is going to make your life better, by and large. Um, so I can't exactly predict technology, so I don't want to say like, what is going to be a good career, but both of us just out of college started doing this kind of thing and got into really But we also don't process. want to discourage you from coming to Penn for grad school. Oh, no. Because there's all sorts of wonderful things that can happen if you do that. I should point out that one of you is seated over a spot that Elon Musk once sat in. Because Elon Musk was a physics major at Penn. His one degree was our physics program. And he figured it was enough. He didn't need anything else. He could just go out and be a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you just don't know how this is going to be. Um, okay. So, real quick uh, discussion of where you are. You are at a very interesting place. Penn was founded by Ben Franklin. Like you, he came here at age 17. And like you, he was wildly successful for the rest of his life. Um, so he came here and was a printer, made enough money by the time he was 40 that he could go do stuff that he was interested in. So first he invented the science of electricity, that got boring, so he founded a country. Okay, somewhere in between he started a school. Um, if you look at our sweatshirts, they say 1740. So this was, you know, 25 years before he was worried about doing a country. As a scientist, Franklin is the guy who named positive and negative. I know there are a number of you out there who wish he had done it better. Um, but at the time, we didn't know. Uh, but he did something huge. He used positive and negative. He didn't use black and white. He didn't use Jack and Jill. Positive and negative combine to be a zero. And what he was saying is that charge was conserved. That we start out with nothing and we get charge by disassociating. Okay? And talking about conservation is about as important a statement as you can make in science. If you find conservation laws, you become a pillar of science. And so Franklin added a really important understanding to what we know about science. He was not just a dabbler. We are not bragging about the guy who founded our country and trying to make you think he was a scientist. He was doing very, very good science and important science. And it's worth noting that conservation of charge is, is in essence, Ben Franklin's work. Lots of other things have happened here. Um, you are currently in David Rittenhouse Laboratory, named after the guy who filled in after Franklin. David Rittenhouse was kind of the second scientist in the country. He was an astronomer. He is also credited with inventing the diffraction grating, which is the device that does a much better job at giving you spectrums than prisms did. Uh, but across the street is an innocuous brick building that started life as a factory, but Penn bought it and turned it into the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. And in 1946, a date that I am proud to say was before I was born. <laughs> um, by a little bit. Um, <laughs> Buckley and Eckert built the first digital computer in the world. Um, yeah, there's, right, for you folks coming in. Right. These people were warned that, that, that new people might sit in the middle of them. Like, you yes. can sit wherever. New unsavory people. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, so what Mockley and Eckert did in 1946 was they started to put together a circuit that would let them do numerical analysis. If you know anything about the history of electronics, you know that they are way ahead of the transistor. So they had to use vacuum tubes, 18,000 of them. Vacuum tubes use lots of electricity, $650 an hour. They spent half a million dollars building it. In 1946, you could buy a four-door Ford family sedan for 1,500 bucks. So this is a lot of money, okay? Uh, please notice the performance, 5 kilohertz processor. Okay, most of you can get a higher frequency on a kazoo. Uh, and 
the memory wasn't even in kilobytes, okay? It was 20 10-digit numbers. Your TI pocket calculator could run rings around this thing. But of course, when you're the only game in town, you don't have to be very good. Uh, it turned out that they realized there were lots of things you could do with this. Uh, Mockley and Eckert were great engineers and scientists. They were horrible businessmen. And so their business model said to them that, you know what, we could market this. And we think the world will need, and what do you think? How many did, did they decide the world needed? Seven. What do you mean? Where do you get sevens of ridiculous number? <laughs> Bingo. They decided that each continent needed one of their device, and so their plan was they were going to build a company that would make seven products. Okay, you don't want to invest with these guys. All right. Uh, needless to say, your car wouldn't run on seven computers. Okay, you need more than that for your car to work these days. So they missed it, other people caught on, and the rest is history. You would think that the origin of the digital computer would be somewhat better uh, marked, uh, but Penn and Mockley and Eckert had a falling out, and then IBM had a lawsuit that took their patent away, and so, you know, history uh, is not reflected in economics. But clearly, this is an important spot. Okay, across the street, caddy corner from Moore, is the uh, Laboratory for Research into the Structure of Matter. It was built in the late 60s, in the early 70s. Uh, Alan McDermott, Alan Heger, uh, and Hideki Shirakawa produced, and, and the Laboratory for Research into the Structure of Matter was put up by Penn with the realization that there was a lot to be found that wasn't chemistry or physics, but was somewhere in between. And so they were going to put up a building where there were no turf wars, where chemists and physicists didn't say, you're in my territory now, and they worked cooperatively. Uh, McDermott was a chemist, Alan Heger was a physicist, and Hideki Shirakawa, I think, was a physicist visiting from Japan. Uh, and they developed electrically conductive plastics. 25 years later, it was realized how important that was and they won a Nobel Prize. Please note, you fight with safety glasses. You think they don't look good. They look like Nobel Prize winners, okay? And so, you know, those glasses and a million dollars and you're the best looking person in the room, okay? So here's that building. We should point out that this was a, a picture taken a while back. If you were to go down the street right here and just take a look to the right of that, there's a new building, a really flashy looking building, glass, it's neat architecture, and it's the Singh Center for Nanotechnology. It was just put in with almost the same idea in mind. This is an emerging technology with great potential for development and all sorts of stuff's going on in there and uh, you know if I live for another 30 years doing this talk I may be showing you a guy who did work today that won a Nobel Prize in 30 years okay but this is one of the important ideas behind science that you want to try to look at where it's headed um, in 1967 Ray Davis figured out a way to detect neutrinos from the sun. Uh, it was pretty sketchy. He did that work and found that the sun was putting out only a third to a half as many neutrinos as the astronomers predicted. People started out by saying, Ray, you don't know what you're doing. Then they said, okay, maybe you do, Ray, but maybe the astronomers don't know what they're doing. And it turned out that they did. So then they said, well, maybe particle physicists don't know what they're doing. And that's what turned out, that we didn't understand neutrinos. It took quite a while to resolve all those whose fault is this. But when the fault is that we don't understand the fundamental particles of nature, you end up winning a Nobel Prize also. Okay? And so Ray Davis was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2002. But notice 
This is not given out willy-nilly. They take a little bit of time to figure out whether it's worthwhile. Okay. So, we're going to go back and start kind of at the beginning. Our topic this year is mechanics. Um, and uh, let's start with the most basic thing. And, you know, Isaac Newton gave us the three laws of motion and not only started physics, but maybe started science, okay, with the realization that there were some fundamental and repeatable rules that um, you could count on. They would explain what you had seen, and maybe more importantly, they would give you the power to predict things that you hadn't seen. The first of these laws is a law that I think gets short shrift. It's easy to think it's simple. Newton's first law says an object at rest remains at rest, and that was old news. That was understood by the ancient Greeks. So here I have an object, it's at rest, I'll just put it there, <laughs> we'll do an experiment, right? Okay, now's the time for those who's and us. like, ooh, it's not moving, okay? And so that part of the law is correct. But the breakthrough was that he put a second part on that statement. He said an object in motion will continue to move unless acted on by an outside force. So why didn't the Greeks get that one? Well, the Greeks were actually doing good science. When they pushed the object, that didn't happen. It just stopped. In ancient Greece, roads were dirt. Carts were made of wood, they had wooden axles, wooden wheels, and motors were oxen. And if the ox didn't pull, the cart didn't move. They didn't have brakes on ox carts, they didn't need them. Objects didn't move unless they were pushed. So this is a case where we see what has continued to be true, we needed some technology. So this isn't just a red hunk of metal, this is a, a ghastly expensive red hunk of metal, way too expensive. If you really want to make money, don't do my job. Make the equipment that I buy, okay? And for a mere hundred bucks, you can have this little doodad that's only slightly better than a Hot Wheels car. But what's better is it's got really good wheels. And so now, if I take this, Whoa, that's a lot better than it was before, isn't it? Okay, now, in fact, if this cart were long enough, it would be even better still, but we can spend even more money, get more technology. Now note, here's Greece, it stops, but if we turn on a vacuum cleaner, blow air through the tube, put pinholes in the tube, suddenly the air's coming up and these two guys don't touch. And now we've really eliminated the external forces. And ah, uh, that's what I'm going to do. Okay? And so now the second half of that law is really apparent. This is why Newton is so highly regarded. Newton figured this out without all this stuff. He didn't spend any money. <laughs> he stopped and said, well, how should this be working? Okay, what I'm looking at is a complicated event. I'm not just looking at a thing on a table. I'm looking at a thing and a table. And the table has a lot to say about what the thing is doing. And so when this thing moves, it isn't stopping because of it. It's stopping because of the table. And if I get that out of the way, it's going to keep going. So this complicated statement is summarized in a single word and that word is inertia. We say all objects have inertia and that inertia is a resistance of the object not to motion. If you're sloppy, you get out of physics class, you say okay I know what inertia is, it's a resistance to motion. You blew it and you blew it big. Objects don't care about motion, what they don't want to do is change their motion. And so inertia is a resistance to changes in motion. If I'm sitting still, I don't want to get moving. But if I'm moving, I don't want to stop moving. I want to keep going. 
If you understand that, you discover gravity in almost no time. People think discovering gravity was a big deal. No, no, discovering inertia was a big deal. Because up until Newton came along, the question that astronomers asked was, what pushes planets around in their orbits? They were asking the wrong question. Newton was the first guy to realize, I don't need to know what's pushing them around. They're moving, they want to keep moving. But they want to keep moving in a straight line. The question isn't why are they moving, it's why aren't they going straight. And so I need a force that bends them around. And there was a moment when Newton and when almost every other famous scientist, I mean, think about, you know, like, don't just look at this. Look at this as a human event. There was a moment when the only guy on the whole damn planet who knew that was Isaac Newton. And that's a pretty cool thing. And like then, the next question is, do you tell anybody? <laughs> you know, or do you just walk around and say, God, I am cool. <laughs> okay? uh, but Newton actually didn't tell everybody right away because he didn't want to fight about it. And it took a while. Edmund Haley, who was trying to explain comets, went to Newton to talk about math, and Newton said, oh, I, I've worked all that out. <laughs> and so what Haley really discovered was Newton. Um, okay, so we measure this inertia with a unit called mass, not weight. And the difference between mass and weight is easy to get sloppy with. But rather than talk to you about spending huge amounts of money, I'm going to suggest that you simply take a big heavy book. Okay? Back in the days when teachers told the bold brazen articles to put their hand out to get hit, okay, one of the other penalties that you got for not following the, the rules was you got to stand in the back of the room and hold two textbooks out at arm's length. And that was fine when you were 16, but you know, when you're in your 60s, we won't say how deep into your 60s you are, okay, this is really annoying for your rotator cuff. Okay, so let's imagine that you are uh, on a space station. You are an obnoxious student. You're on a space station in the 50s when corporal punishment was still cool. You've got a teacher who hasn't really been paying attention. And the teacher tells you to stand in the back of the room and hold these books out at arm's length. And you kind of laugh and go back and hold your weightless book out at arm's length. And, and you know, it's not really a big issue. But if you're a savvy teacher, you know that you've gone into space and you've lost weight, right? The thing's weightless. It's not massless. So how do we punish this student? We say, Mr. Burner, you bold, brazen article, go back there and wave these books around. <laughs> and so now we hold the book out and we wave it back and forth. And this is just as hard as it is on Earth. And so the fact that this thing fights me in both directions is not weight, it's inertia. And this is worth doing. I've tried to get enough of these books that there was one at each seat for you to try this. We couldn't get them. But I'm sure you can find one, okay? Or at least a picture of one. Um, so let's put this in another context. Okay, you and your Russian colleague are on the International Space Station. Your Russian colleague is now using your bunk to store his stuff, okay? <laughs> You have asked repeatedly for him to move his borscht and whatever else he's got, nuclear warheads, all those things that evil Russians have. You want them off of your bunk. He's not going to do it. You get into an argument. You get somewhat excited. You pick up the operating manual to the space station. Weightless, of course. And throw it at this annoying Russian. It goes flying across. The Russian, of course, was in a physics class, knows the book is weightless, and decides nothing to worry about. It's a weightless book. And so it comes flying over. It catches the Russian in the temple. And what comes of it? Nothing, right? It's weightless. No, you... You end up knocking him as unconscious as Rocky knocked his Russian opponent. 
Okay? Why? Not because of weight, but because of inertia. The book doesn't want to stop. The book keeps moving. The book moves his skull. His skull runs into his brain. Okay? Uh, you know, he's now got concussion, uh, whatever, and can't play for the next two weeks. Okay? Um, but the point is, we maintain inertia, we maintain mass. Weight has to do with how hard we're pulled down to the surface of the earth. Peter? So, as we tend to do in science, we explain something, and then we spend a lot of time nitpicking little parts of it over and over again. So, we're going to talk about things not wanting to move and how we make them move. So, we have a wooden block. The wooden block sits on the table, and it obviously does not want to move. So the question is, what does the wooden block do if I then hit it on the side with a hammer? It moves, right? We understand some things. But what's more interesting, what if we have a stack of wood blocks? and I hit the bottom one with a hammer. So now, all of these have mass, all of them don't want to move. The bottom one is going to be introduced to the hammer. The rest of the stack is only going to be interacting with other parts of the stack. So those fell straight down and they hit the ball pin because I wasn't quite fast enough. But we can knock out individual ones there, right? This is really competitive Jenga at this point. <laughs> because I can interact with only parts of it. Because things don't want to move. So, you thought you were just on a field trip, but it's time for a quiz. Because that's how we do this. So, this is... A three kilogram mass. If you don't know the metric system, you really, really should. The metric system says that this is that this is about seven pounds. We have here a length of string that is ten pound test. So ten pounds will snap that string. Here is more string of the same kind. So ten pounds will snap it. So the question is. If I pull on this string, what breaks? Who has an idea? That can hold 10 pounds, this can hold 10 pounds, this weighs 7 pounds. Alright, so we have two possible outcomes, right? Someone who doesn't want to put their name down on one answer, can do the best. Alright, do we have any other guesses? All right, top one. What's the top one? Uh, well, if you're kind of think of it like a you know, train, all right. so you're well, you're introducing energy, sure. the energy will fall all the way out and snap at the top. Sure. So all of this can move. This can't move. So that becomes the place where it could fall apart. Okay. Other thoughts. All right. All hypotheses are equal until we test them and show which ones are terrible. Um, yeah. So there, the thing is that the strings on the top is looped around, so yeah. that creates two strings. This is, this is also double over. This is double over, it's just hard to see because there's no anything holding it apart. It is, I promise. Okay. No, it's fine. Um, are, 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 the, are both those strings supporting an equal amount of weight? No. That's one string, that's one string. I'm going to be pulling on the whole thing. What about the green ones? The green one is there so I don't break my hand. Whenever right. it falls down. Wow. The green one <laughs> is indication of genius. Yeah, that is. <laughs> that is, I have to do this show again, you know, and I don't want to break my hand. <laughs> See, the, the, the rule used to be, do not do this experiment with remaining unbroken hand. <laughs> Here, we'll even do this, because we don't trust that that top one is actually doing it, so we will switch to a shorter string just to prove that point, right? to make it more obvious that it is not holding weight. So we'll switch to a whatever. Better not than that. Same way. Really good. 
Why it could be either. Any other guesses? No one thinks the bottom one, the one that my hand, my strong, powerful, much younger <laughs> hand is holding on to. The one that's going to break. Oh, right, no confidence in the break. <laughs> We've been getting cocky. Alright. So, I hear maybe both. I hear the top one. Let's find out. Woo! One more book. So, why should we not trust our industrious leaders here who told us that the top one is the one that's going to break? Why is the bottom one the one that broke instead? Um, you pulled it back with the <coughs> No, that's not much of an issue. So remember, this has a bunch of inertia. Inertia doesn't want to move, right? So this doesn't want to move. So thinking with that in mind, that this doesn't want to move as I pull on it, why is the top one the one that survived? Because the tension doesn't change from the bottom. All right, so this one isn't moving. So because these two don't move apart from each other, there's no change in the tension then, right? So by having this large mass, we're protecting that top string. <laughs> so, so, the two lessons you should immediately take away from this. One, I could have been a con man, but used my powers for good. And two, often the answer with the most details and finesse to it has those details in fast because it's correct, right? That absolutely, it is the way that I pull on that string that changes this. We can show that specifically by instead of using a spring, by instead of using a string, we can use something that's a little bit elastic. So if I pull slowly, right, this doesn't want to move, but it will move because I'm a lot stronger than it, right? So if I pull slow enough, I can get everything else to move as well, right? Someone doesn't want to move, but you just lean against them, right? And you just keep leaning against them, and then they get off that armrest, and now it's your armrest, right? <laughs> but, if you pull very quickly, right? When you pull quickly, there isn't enough time for this to start moving, because you're moving now too fast for that. So you end up snapping that bottom string. So, in the continuing vein of we take things way too far, because that's what we do, this was things not wanting to move. Bill is now going to spend more time talking about things that are going to keep moving. So, Peter talked about the, the idea of, of developing a, a, a thing. We, we said that, um, you know, Newton understood inertia that let him go to gravity. So, <clears throat> let's take our knowledge and re-examine the ancient world. So, most educated people from ancient Greece on knew the earth was round. The model they came up with, look, there's a hand in there. <laughs> Incredible, how did that happen? So, here's the earth, okay? And when they looked up in the sky, they noticed planets, stars, sun were all moving in the sky. And the model was that there's the Earth sitting there and the whole mess moves around it. And so they visualized that each of these stars and planets was on a big uh, crystalline sphere that would turn. So there was some debate as to what's doing the moving. Because this is a lot of stuff to move, and it might make more sense if 
if the Earth didn't move. And so most people said, well, hey, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Who cares? But as Peter said, scientists like to get fussy. Okay? Is there a way to tell the difference? Well, if something is turning, it is changing direction. And if it's changing direction, inertia is not going to be happy. And in a rare instance of Frenchmen doing science, <laughs> you think I'll get in trouble for that? Uh, as long as they haven't studied biology. Let, well, that's not science. <laughs> Uh, Leon Foucault, and you can tell he's French because you leave out about half the letters of his name, okay? Leon Foucault said, I can take an inertia case in the form of a pendulum. And now, this is a case where we've got an object that's moving. In fact, it's changing, but it's changing because of an external force of gravity, but it would like to maintain its direction of motion. In other words, there is a line of travel that this pendulum has, okay? And so, people had used pendulums for quite a while, but Foucault proposed that we can answer the question, because we don't know the answer. I had, yeah, here. And he suggested a thought experiment where he said if we could go to the North Pole, if the sky is moving and the earth is sitting still, we put a pendulum in here and the pendulum just keeps doing the same thing. But if the sky is stationary and the earth is moving, the pendulum wants to keep its direction and the earth moves under it. And the breakthrough here was the realization that the string is way too wimpy to make the pendulum change what it's doing. So it's got to be a, a string. We can't set this up with a big rod with hinges and all kinds of silliness. Okay, and so we set this up. We should point out that Foucault did this experiment in Paris. We'll explain how he got away with that in a minute, okay? Uh, but let's go to the North Pole, which we're doing. Now notice we've got a camera on the ceiling. You can tell that because you can see how little hair I actually have. Okay? Uh, but we've also got a camera on the Earth, okay? And that's here. And so... This is the view of an Earth-based observer, and this is a view of a space-based observer. So this camera is on the crystal ball, okay? And this camera is on the Earth. So in a non-moving situation, pretty exciting. Why? Boy, that was worth putting cameras all over the place, wasn't it? Okay? But the question is, what happens if things are moving? And so we're going to set this guy to moving in what is on the screen, a horizontal fashion. And we're going to get the Earth to turn. And so... The Earth-based observer says, I'm sitting still and the pendulum is moving. The space-based observer says, no, no, this whole damn planet's moving and the pendulum <laughs> is doing the same thing. Okay? So we actually need to set up an observer. We're at the North Pole, so we, we get a real North Pole observer. Okay? And so now our North Pole Observer is going to report what's going on. <laughs> and he gets bludgeoned by the moving pendulum. Okay? Um, does this really happen? It does. Now, keep in mind that the way the Earth turns, it's got an equator. Think about what happens if we put our Foucault pendulum at the equator. It's moving in this plane as the Earth turns. It can keep moving in that plane. The folks at the equator don't think the Earth is turning. Okay? Or at least they don't have any good evidence. If you go to the pole, your Foucault pendulum turns in 24 hours. 
And if you do a boatload of trig and physics, you can figure out that on your way down to the equator, it's going to take a time period of 24 hours divided by the sine of your latitude. <laughs> Ugly stuff, huh? But if you're in Philadelphia at latitude 40, it takes 38 hours for that to happen. So it happens. And if you want to check, you go to the Franklin Institute, you go to the main stairwell, and they've got a big pendulum that's swinging away. You go there in the morning when you arrive and take a look at how many chess men are knocked down around the outside of the circle. You come back before you go home and you note a lot more are knocked down. The earth is moving. Okay? And this is really the way science goes. We start out with a really simple thing up to things slide across a tabletop and the next thing you know we're answering questions we thought were purely philosophical. We're saying that the earth is turning and space is sitting still. Okay, and that's one of the reasons people get excited about the subject. So this is Newton's first law. Newton's second law is force and acceleration and all that kind of stuff. But to be honest, that is all a little, I don't want to say finicky, but you have to do measurements and numbers and calculations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and frankly, Bill and I don't feel like doing any of that. So we're jumping straight to the third law. <laughs> So, once again, <coughs> Peter's comments about the, the second law. The second law is mathematical. People <coughs> kind of spend a lot of time on it. I think that there are some conceptual points that we can do a better job with, and this is what the physics demonstrations are about. Can, can we give you images to get this stuff to make sense? And the third law is a place where, you know, the statement, again, sounds so obvious that people don't think enough about it. It's really kind of a critical thing. <clears throat> the statement is objects that, uh, for every force, there's an equal and opposite or every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Kind of poorly stated. Physics books usually do a better job, but people seem to go back to the old statement. It sounds like retribution. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, I'm getting back at him. Yeah. He did that and I'm gonna do and, and that's not what's, what's happening is it's, it's much better stated as forces can only exist in opposite pairs. And it is crucially important and it's easy to ignore. So for instance, if, if you want to lift weights, or I'm sorry, if you want to build your body up, you need to get your muscles accustomed to exerting a force. And if you look, you know, people can afford it, belong to a gym, or own a weight set, okay? And you say, well, I can't do either of them, but you know, I can, I can do that, <laughs> okay? And so you're doing the same thing that they're doing, and you're not getting any stronger. Okay? And you're not getting any stronger because you're trying to exert a single force. They don't exist. That's why you need weights. That's why you need, you know, winging machines and circuit trainers and all of that. So let's take a look. Here's a, a scale, which is a force meter. And I'm going to pull on it. And it keeps reading zero, time after time. After, there's no force happening here. Okay? The only way to get one force is to have two. I need to pull on that. And to show that even better, Peter's going to take this. We spent weeks practicing. <laughs> we, we can, I, I can even tell what he's thinking, and we can pull with exactly the same force. Look at that. Look, I'm not even looking. I just know what he's going to do. I know exactly. When I let that go, I knew he's letting go. Okay, when I pulled harder, I knew it was going to happen. Okay? It turns out, I can't not do it. Right? We can't get these to not read the same thing. Okay? Regardless of what we do. And in fact, 
even klutzes like yourselves could get this to work. Okay? So, so we've got forces occurring in pairs. Now sometimes that's easy to see. So for instance, this is always, you know, am I still strong enough at my age to <laughs> So, the elastic balloon is going to push air out the back of the balloon. It turns out the balloon is not, doesn't have lots of inertia. So when we push the air this way, the equal and opposite force pushes the balloon the other way. So that's all well and good. But now let's say that I push this table, or this cart across the floor. You're going to say, well, okay, that's one force, right? You just push the car close. If you think there's only one force, the problem is you don't have a wide enough angle lens on your mental camera. You need to see bigger. And so what's actually going on here? I'm pushing here, but the opposite force is my feet on the floor. So yeah, yeah, okay. Luckily, I have the world's silliest skateboard. <laughs> and I can put this on the floor. And, and now, I no longer have the grip between my shoes and the floor, which I told you was the other force. And so I'm going to stand on this which is only slightly less dangerous than walking out of my house this morning. <laughs> and I'm going to do the same thing with the car. And notice I don't succeed at moving the car. Because I can't generate a force between me and the car. There's no grip on the floor. I don't have that opposite force. I can't give the car to force. Okay? Uh, that reality is the whole reason in the beginning for athletic shoes. Of course, today, they're just really cool, and I've got to spend $600 on those sneaks, because I know they'll be worth 1000 tomorrow. Uh, but depending on what surface you're playing on, the deal is you need to generate an opposite force. So for turf sports, you're going to use spikes. For rock climbing, you're going to use anti-spikes, okay? Super slick, works really well until it rains, and then it's like, oh my god, I'm going to die, okay? Um, and anywhere in between. It is an interesting point that once again, for those of us who grew up in the 50s, macho dudes playing football had two-inch spikes on their shoes. Like, boy, could you generate force. In fact, you could generate a force far stronger than the tendons in your knees and ankles. And so there was all kinds of leg injury because opposite forces exceeded biological forces, which of course they didn't understand because it's not a science. Um, so now we're down to dinky little, you know, one inch spikes in order to do that. Um, so this is one case where we see third law. Uh, Peter's got another very neat instance of the third law coming into play. So another place where it's easy to forget until like the weather's bad of where there's third laws is something like driving a car. So we have a car for the sake of people in the back. We have two cars because we were fairly clever and the people who designed these cars were a little lazy. Both cars can use the same remote. So, these cars about even will win in a race when they're against each other. They're pretty matched cars. But, if we take one of their cars and put it on terrible terrain. So we have a small board. That board is on, is on these rollers. Now we put the car on those rollers. What's going to happen when they try to drive off? What? Well, that did not deserve applause. No oohs 
Sinatra. Awesome. You're not that good. No, that was good. I'll still take it. So, it was very obvious with that back car what the third, where that third law was. The car went forward by pushing the wood plank back. Now, the question is, why did the first car go forward if the cart didn't go back? The easy way for the, uh, probably the easiest solution for this is a, is instead of you didn't look big enough, you didn't look small enough, right? This thing, you won't notice if it moves the kind of motion it does, right? I promise you, we have the kind of science that we could do those measurements. If we cared, we don't. <laughs> we can show that if you get enough things going in one direction, you can slow down the Earth. We can show this with water currents and stuff, that the Earth will change the speed in which it is rotating based on things on it moving. So we've all had a little bit of experience with this kind of stuff. Cars is a thing we use every day. There are a couple other things that use that are based on this that we use less often, but it is worth our time to be talking about. Yeah, okay, cool. uh, okay, so interesting question. Now let's let's talk about how do you move. So we've already kind of talked about when I walk on the floor, right? Where's the second force? Okay, my body's going forward, and now we know the second force is we're pushing on the floor. And if we're on a carpet or on a piece of wood, we can actually see that other push move the object. How does an well, how do you swim? You're not on the ground. What, where's the other force? We're pushing off the water. And if you note, know, when you swim, it's critically important to get your arms out of the water as they come forward so they can go back and push water backward. If you just have your arms underwater all the time and go forward, backward, forward, back, you don't move and you sure don't win any Olympic medals. Okay? Um, and so we got to push a lot of water backwards to get ourselves to go forward. How about an airplane? Now, now there's almost nothing, right? What's an airplane do? Okay, so now tell me if I'm lying. Look, look, you can see his hair moving. There's air being pushed out of this fan. This is what an airplane does. A propeller does it externally. A jet engine does it internally. And we can actually move through the air. This is a fairly expensive fan card. I told you that little orange red thing is ghastly, so is that fan, but it's wimpy. You didn't risk life and limb to get here on an icy day to see a wimpy car. Uh, we've got a fan card. <laughs> So, as before, for the people in the back, we have a fan cart. The fan can blow air this way. When we turn this on, what's going to happen? the other direction. Let's take this a step simpler in technology, but a little bit more complicated in physics. So instead of an airboat, let's talk about a sailboat. So, we have a sailboat. We have wind. So, as we just saw, 
I turned on the fan, the fan moved. Right? What is going to happen now when I turn on the fan? doesn't move easily and it just blows air around, right? The sailboat, on the other hand, is designed to take that force and run with it. Now, some of you may have wondered this, right? If a fan can push a sailboat, why don't we just put fans on the sailboats? <laughs> right? You don't need to wait for wind. There is no doldrums, right? You just turn on the fan and you go. <laughs> is this going to work? No. Are you saying no because obviously I would be a millionaire not here if I had figured this out before everyone else? <laughs> or do you have a physics reason that this does not work? Yeah. <laughs> <It's elaborate. laughs> yeah. Well, before when it was blowing, like, and it was not on the yep. boat, it was on the boat. Was pushing on the floor and okay. was pushing back on it, but now it's going to be pushing back on the boat in the opposite direction that's trying to push it, so it's going to cancel. Out. Okay, so now the fan is going to start pushing air this way. The fan needs to brace itself from falling over, so it is bracing itself against the boat. So it is now pushing on the boat as hard as it is trying to push against the boat. <laughs> now, to show that this is in fact what's going on. Oh, no, I was, I was gonna lift this. <laughs> right, you wanna lift this? Yeah. So, what, what happens if we pull the fan, or pull the, the sail? Which way is it, will it move, and if so, which way? stuff you're going to push back, right? So mostly a rocket is fuel. 
You need about 95 pounds of fuel to put about five pounds of stuff in orbit. So here we've got a rocket. It's almost all fuel tank. The CO2 fire extinguisher. We've annoyed the CO2 fire extinguisher people greatly <laughs> by, it, they've worked hard at making this not a rocket. And the way they do it is that the, at both ends of this hose, instead of an open end, there's a cap with holes at 90 degrees. So anything that pushes, pushes in opposite directions and you don't get blown out of the burning building as you try to put the fire out. <laughs> really boring. We've cut all them off. When we try to get these things refilled, they say, but we can't refill that. That's really dangerous. It could be a rocket. And we say, no. <laughs> so we can set this up. Now, remember, we have said for every force, there is a matched pair going the other way, so we've got really expensive force detectors now the back here. Okay? And we need a test pilot. Uh, you wondered what this was, right? And I should point out that Peter knows the rest of the show just in case. <laughs> ready? Are you ready? No, I'm not ready. And you can't move a person with a normal size CO2 extinguisher. You need the big 15 pound one, those wimpy little five pound ball suckers don't do anything. So don't try this. So yes, do not try this in your school hall. Alright, so that was Newton. That was Newton's first law and Newton's third law. With the general Newton fins, that's a pretty good base for getting into some more interesting mechanics. Um, so we are going to do that here after we give you a chance to stand up and stretch. There are pretzels and drinks in the hallway. Please, what? Whoa, whoa! I'm not finished! Sit <laughs> We have supplies for one drink and one pretzel per person. You're allowed it's probably very cold in that hallway. We are fine with you finishing the guy at your seat as long as you're not a pig about it. Try to keep this clean. We are going to start with or without you at five after. So that is your chance to because go back and get snacks. We got too much. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your snack and drink. Please be considered and take any garbage out with you when you're done. Don't be a mess about things. So, during the first act, you may have noticed that just about everything we were talking about was one object moving in one direction. Right? One object, one D, that kind of thing. Which is normally the place you start with in physics, because most of physics is trying to take complicated things and turning them into many simple things one after each other. So, this act, the rest of this show, we're going to be taking a few different ways to complicate those matters further. And the first one we're going to do is by getting into two-dimensional motion, projectile motion specifically, which we should know a thing or two about. Should we give it one more chance? Yeah. All right. So, as you may have guessed at this 
point. I was fairly confident of where that ball was going to be and that Bill was going to have enough time to get it. Um, because this is projectile motion. It's a, it's a, a great window into, into two-dimensional things. Um, but I know that was a little fast. So we took the liberty of taking, a projectile mo uh, taking some projectile motion and making a stop motion animation of it so that you can see every individual point. And here it is. <laughs> so this is a pink object that is going off the edge of something horizontally and then falling the rest of the way. So this is something driving off of a cliff uh, or throwing something out of a window, things like that. If you will notice, we have horizontal and vertical, right? We, can, we tend to like to separate things into individual chunks. If something happens to be at 90 degrees, which is why we always base everything on 90 degrees, it usually is pretty easy for us to pull that apart. So we can look at this in just the horizontal and just the vertical. So if we look at just the strings and where they each match here, each of these strings is the same distance apart from each other. And each of these balls is the same distance apart in time. So what do we call that relationship between distance and time? Velocity. Velocity. Good. You're showing yourself off. Most people yell speed at that. <laughs> so this is velocity. So in the horizontal direction, we have a constant velocity. At each point in time, the ball is the same distance away from where it started. Right? So we are maintaining this horizontal velocity. But if we look in just the vertical direction, each string is longer. And they are longer by the amount that the ball would drop during that amount of time. So I just said to you that this horizontal motion is completely independent of this vertical motion. So if we fire this object horizontally and have it fall to the ground, or we drop an object from the same location and have it fall to the ground, this says they should take the same amount of time. Now, you could just take that on faith, but this is physics. If there is a test for something, we're going to try to do that test. So, Bill is going to fire and drop an object at the same time. And, uh, um, so, this gadget that I've got here is an interesting artifact of a school that started in 1740. You will note that it's made out of brass and wood, and it takes advantage uh, of <coughs> inertia. So what Peter has described is that we could imagine that if the water were running off Niagara Falls, and just as it leaves the falls, it knocks a boulder off the lip of the falls. The boulder drops, the water goes out, and the proposal is that both of them are going to land at the same time. A little hard to imagine. The water's going much further than the boulder. So we've got a, a device that's going to let us do that. So this is a spring plunger gun. And when I pop it, it's going to pop a ball that way. And that's pretty simple. But the cool thing is that the rod comes back here and hangs out. And we have a second ball with a hole in it. And I can put that ball on the rod. So now it's in a situation where when the rod pulls out from it, gravity takes over and it just drops straight. Now, we're going to use an incredibly complex timing device, which is your ears and brain. Okay? So we're actually getting into some science we don't yet understand. Um, you are going to listen carefully. And to help you, we have put aluminum plates down on the floor. So you're going to listen to see if <coughs> these guys land together or if we're just whistling Dixie. OK? So excitement is. Do you all have your apparatus ready? <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't. We didn't hit the target, are you kidding me? Is there any way we're that putsy? Yes, you only heard one. 
Okay, here we go again. Whoa, one clang. Okay, I suppose we ought to do one more just to prove. But right now, our law of science is a 50-50 proposition, right? That's, that's not good data. So the hypothesis seems to be a good one. All right. Now, this is final, but most of the time we're not firing things horizontally, right? We're firing them off at angles, right? You're throwing things, you're firing. So how does all of this change if we're trying to fire this at something other than horizontally? Lucky for us, we have designed this apparatus just with that in mind. So now, notice, the strings are still all the same distance apart. The horizontal velocity is still constant. This rail, which was the direction we fired the ball at the beginning, when we were horizontal, is still the same direction we fired the ball. If there was no gravity, the projectile would go along that ramp. Right? As before, the length of the string is how far away from that initial path the ball would go each time. So as we go, each string gets longer, and that's how far away the object is being pulled. Now, if this is all true, and we believe all of this, so, now that I have the goodwill of all that oohs and ahs and applause, I'm going to ruin it. Time for a quiz. So, there are some physics problems that are so famous and so well used that they have names. This is one of them, my personal favorite. It is called the monkey hunting problem. So, I am a hunter. I am trying to shoot a monkey because that's what hunters do. They try to shoot interesting animals, apparently. I know my prey because I put in my work that the loud bang of a gun will startle a monkey and that monkey <coughs> will immediately freak out and let go. So the moment I fire my gun and the bullet leaves the gun, the monkey will freak out, let go, and start falling out of the tree. So the question is, where do I have to aim my gun so that I can shoot the monkey? <laughs> I have that I aim at the monkey. Alright, other thoughts? Any other answers? I have to shoot the monkey because I am a hunter and that's what I do. <laughs> Remember we said biology doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Extinction, not a problem. The laws of physics are what's important. Bill, someone's trying to answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So you find out when they're at the same place. Right. Okay, so I lead my shot that I know how monkeys tend to fall, and I aim where I know the monkey's going to be, right? Yeah. Like when, like when someone turns and you throw the football in front of them, right? You're throwing to where they're going to end up. Right? Any other thoughts? Uh, at the original position of the monkey. Right, so at the monkey, leading in front of the monkey. Any others? All hypotheses are equal until we test them. All right, I shoot horizontal. Right, I shoot straight. Right? Okay, so this is science. We have to test things. Now first, I really don't want to shoot a monkey because enough things are dying anyway right now. So I'm going to shoot something I know is dead. Right? <laughs> so this is an electromagnet. At the end of that gun is a switch 
So that when that switch is on, <laughs> the magnet is holding something. If something were to leave that gun, the magnet turns off, the object drops. So we load the gun. So there's a half inch ball bearing, it's a blow gun. Then we, <laughs> we turn it on. I may be a scientist, but I appreciate a good luck charm. <laughs> now, some of you, especially people on this side of the room, may have noticed there is a small white dot just above the target that has a cross on it. The distance between the green belly and that dot happens to be the same distance between my sight and my barrel. So I'm aimed directly at my target. And if I'm good enough at this, I'm clean enough shot. Now, now with my amazing skill as a hunter, how did I know with my amazing skill as a hunter, how did I know that I had to blow the tar that I had to blow my shot that hard to hit my target? How did I know how hard to blow? It didn't matter how hard it was. Are you saying I have no skill as a hunter? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So, we have heard that maybe it doesn't matter. With all of my explanations of how this was working, how the projectiles were working, how the pink balls looked. Did I ever mention what the velocity was? No. Because it doesn't matter. Both of these objects are going to be going down at the same rate. So as long as I make the projectile go fast enough that it can get to that side of the room before the object falls down, yeah. Ah. Sorry. I had too many questions. Give me, give me no shot. So now you know what too slow is. There we go. Right. So as long as I shoot this, enough velocity to reach the target is going to work. Now, that doesn't much change velocity. What? This is the future. We're in 2018. What if I'm not hunting monkeys? What if I'm hunting space monkeys? Right? And I have this entire setup on Venus. Right? Different planets, different gravity. How do I have to change my technique now that we're on another planet? <laughs> I hear those murmurs, and those murmurs are correct. I don't need to change anything. Just as before, I didn't have to say what my velocity was, and I never had to say what gravity was. As long as the gravity of my object that I'm trying to shoot and the gravity of my projectile are the same, it's going to work out. Now, that does suggest, what if it's not the same on both objects. What if I'm trying to shoot an object that's being pulled down by gravity at an object that isn't being pulled down by gravity? What if the monkey doesn't get scared? What if I have to shoot it out of the tree? As you can imagine, that is a much more complex problem. So complex, Bill and I cannot be bothered to try to solve it. But, as we mentioned at the beginning, we built a computer that took up an entire building so that we could figure out that problem. That's why we invented the computer here. So that we would know where to aim our guns at things that weren't falling. Right? That kind of shows how complex things can get very, very quickly. So this was projectile motion. Right? One object moving in two directions. Another way that we could make things a little bit more interesting is what if we have multiple things moving instead? Yeah. 
that I frequently come out and say physics is the study of energy. And then we proceed to do a really bad job of convincing people that there's any reason to talk about energy. Certainly in, a, in our first year courses, um, you know, th there's a lot of other stuff that becomes a distraction. And I think one of the problems is that we talk about energy quantitatively, but we don't come up with any good conceptual behaviors. And so I think that a place, it, like, because I think that the problem is that we need to convince you that the complications of the equations are worth the effort. In other words, we have a situation that it's clear the easiest way to explain it is these annoying formulas. So energy is one half mv squared, like multiple terms, powers, all kinds of annoyance. Okay, is there a reason for that? Well, there is. So, what we have here are a number of things we call coupled oscillators. And so, the behavior on these is kind of interesting. If I pull down this mass and just let it move, we notice that for some reason the other guy decides that looks like fun and he wants to play. Okay? And they're both moving, but the really interesting thing is the guy I started said, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore, okay? Until now the other guy reactivates him. And so they aren't just randomly bouncing around. They seem to be trading something. So here the guy that started out not moving is not moving. How did that happen? Okay. So now we've got a systematic behavior that we probably don't have a good explanation for. And so what's being traded back and forth? We don't have a vocabulary for that until we talk about energy. And what we see here is a spring mass system, and we know about potential and kinetic energies, we also have a weak coupling. It's not that I didn't have enough money to put an I-beam across the top of this. I got an old hacksaw blade and threw it in there because it wobbles a little. And it wobbles enough to take whatever that quantity we talked about, energy, and send it over to this guy. Okay? Maybe the most famous of these doodads that you've seen, and this one, it happens almost too fast to analyze, so this is kind of fun to watch, but we don't necessarily look for any better explanations. And so we can make this transfer energy in a pretty simple fashion. Slow is better because we have time to think about the process. Peter's got another slow one in which the pendulum transfers are not quite as quick. So in this case we have a large pendulum attached by a very dinky spring to another large pendulum. We have it up there so you can see it a little bit cleaner. We start one of them moving. As it is moving, this stuff, this animal, this energy is being put, is being transferred through this dinky spring into the other one. And it starts moving. As it starts moving more and more, we notice that the first one swings less and less until it effectively stops. While the other one is swinging, believe me, about as much as the, one, the first one started. <coughs> and then something moving, something not moving, connected by a weak coupler, that energy starts transferring back. Now, as we said earlier, humans are not dumb creatures. 
And humans have been effectively the same for thousands upon thousands of years. So why is it only in the last couple hundred years that we were able to figure this stuff out? If, you know, cavemen were about as smart as us, they just didn't go to school. The answer is because it is almost never this clean, right? There's always other stuff going on, which we can show with a rug. So if we get this moving, and I bring up this rug so it just touches this other one. We have this energy. It's transferring into the other one. The other one is grinding against the carpet. It moves a little bit, but it pretty much stops. This one keeps moving a bit and pretty much stops. And I didn't build a good clock, right? <laughs> All of this is very messy. We need to take into account this pendulum, how it interacts with this spring, how this spring interacts with this pendulum, how this pendulum interacts with the spring and the carpet. And you may be wondering, if all of this is so messy, how do we deal with it? The reason that we can deal with all of this is energy may seem messy with exponents and factors and things. It's less messy than trying to explain this without it. Right? If we tried to do this with just <coughs> new forces, reverse forces, uh, you know, all of that, inertia, this would be a nightmare. And energy is cleaner than that. So energy may seem like, why are we doing all these complicated things? It, because it's less complicated than all the alternatives. Right? The big thing that we're trying to do in science is we're trying to match all of the meters in the world with more precision. And if we can figure out a faster way to do that, a cleaner way to do that, a more accurate way to do that, that's the way we're all going to do it. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to match all the numbers on the meter. A slightly more interesting one, interesting enough that it is, has a nice goofy name that sticks in your brain, we have here. So you'll note there's a brass weight, a spring, and we've got a pinwheel on it for a reason that will become immediately obvious. I'm gonna set this guy into motion. We're just gonna let him bounce up and down. And notice it starts turning. I, that turning's not my doing, okay? <clears throat> but once again, notice that we've got a coupling and pretty soon it's not bouncing at all, it's just turning. And now it's gonna start bouncing what is going on here? Sure, you don't want to mess with me. <laughs> and pretty soon, it's not turning, it's just bouncing. So, this is called a Wilberforce pendulum. Because it uses the mysterious Wilberforce. No, it's not it. I am not kidding you. The guy who invented this was named Wilberforce. What? Is that possible? When you go up the Jersey Turnpike to New York City, just before you get up to New York City, one of the last exits in New Jersey is the Outer Bridge Crossing, which you figure must be a place where the Outer Bridge was. No, no. There was a guy named Outer Bridge. Okay? I mean, so there are some unexplainable things, but that's history and we don't do unexplainable things, okay? So the Wilberforce pendulum is a coupled oscillator and what's going on here looks a little magical, but it's not. It turns out that if I stretch a spring, it's got to uncoil. As it tries to uncoil, it twists and there, there is a subtle but important point. This isn't hanging on a hook. The spring goes through a solid piece of metal. So when the spring tries to turn, it twists the metal. Okay? And the same's going on at the top. So most spring oscillators, the spring's turning, but it can swivel in the hook. It can't do that here. So we're getting to see the swivel effect as well as the bounce effect. <coughs> idea of energy, right? We've kind of gotten across this idea that there could be an energy due to something like height, right? That energy could become something else, like emotion. We're 
can we get energy from? Right? So we got energy from height. We get energy from, from something stored in the spring. Can we ever just get energy? Can we end up with more energy than what we started with? So, we can test that in a necessarily overly dramatic way. So, we have a bowling ball. <laughs> that bowling ball is on the end of a wire. And when this moves, it is pretty free to move. Right? And we have a nice wrecking ball. So not much energy can get out. So the question is, could we ever get more energy back in? So we know that we have height energy. Down here at the bottom, we have no height. So we can assume that this is all motion energy at this point. And then that motion energy is going to become height energy again. And because we know it's swinging back and forth, there has to be some point out here where there is no motion. So we presume that all of that becomes height energy again. So how can we show if the initial height is the same as the final height in a way that you feel like it's worth your time that you were here. So we have a lot of energy swinging around and we want to make sure that my hand up, I actually do have a dentist appointment after this show and I need to make sure that things are okay. <laughs> Dennis can fix this. Alright. Hey, Hangman is real good. So, if I hold this up next to my face and let go, I'm saying that there's no way that it could ever get the energy necessary to get to a height higher than my face. So it should be fine if I put my face here. Now, you may be wondering, if you believe in all of this science and physics stuff enough that you do this for a living, why are you wearing a face mask? <laughs> so you won't wear a face mask. No death! <laughs> so, of all the things that you can do, this is a legitimate safety thing, and it shows a good amount of science. <laughs> when you look at that I will strongly encourage you to not try this at home. Not just because you would need to have an eye beam and you would need to destroy someone's bowling ball. But the way that this experiment tends to go very, very poorly is that people do an energy experiment and a Newton's third law experiment at the same time. It takes force to pull this up. So what's the easiest way for me to put force on this? Is by leaning back good and far. And then when I let go, I don't have that force anymore. So I stand up straight. <laughs> that is why I do this for a living, and I'm telling you not to try. <laughs> so this was our overly complicated example of where energy cannot come from. We also have an overly complicated example of how to put energy into a system. You know we've got elastic energy if we pull down. 
When we go up, we get gravitational energy. When we're moving, we have kinetic energy. Um, we need to put a mass on the end of this spring, or you could just drop the M, and we can put an ass on the end of this system. If we had a sonic ranger and graphs and things, we could show that my motion is sinusoidal in time. If we take an accelerometer, okay, so this is an accelerometer, and it lights in such a way and I'm probably supposed to hang on to this so I don't die. <laughs> okay, so now notice the arrows point in the direction of acceleration. Okay, so when I'm down they're pointing up and when I'm up they're pointing down, right? So the acceleration is always trying to get me back to the middle. And of course that's at the heart of any oscillation is that the force keeps changing direction. Am I lying? No, it's doing that. Oh, it's doing that. Amazing. Okay, now the other point that Peter pointed out and that we saw with coupled oscillators is that there's nowhere else for the energy to go. So the energy is either potential gravity, kinetic, or potential elastic. We don't have friction, we're not losing anything. So we can do something very interesting. It's something that you did when you were a kid and you forgot about it. And that is you got a friend swinging on a swing. So I'm about 150 pounds, maybe more because I have change in my pocket, okay? Um, Peter is gonna lift me a couple of feet. He's gonna do it with one hand and almost no effort. Now, notice that he's just pushing a little bit, and here I am already moving a foot. Now he's lifted 150 pounds, two feet. Now I'm getting sick. Uh, so, what's happening? He's delivering small amounts of energy at just the right time. We call this resonance. And it is the reason that those coupled oscillators would move energy back and forth because small doses of energy were delivered repeatedly. Now, we're going to use that for a very interesting task. Okay? So, first I have to get off of this. Now, now see, this is the thing you shouldn't do at home, is get off of it. <laughs> because the spring's got lots of energy in it, and you need to find a way to get rid of that energy. Without killing yourself or catching body parts in the spring. Okay? And uh, once again, I've succeeded. <laughs> okay, 
documentaries about it. Tacoma Narrows is a thing you may have heard of. You've probably seen videos of a bridge with cars on it that's going like a bouncy castle, right? That is due to resonance. That there's a little bit of energy and wind, but it kept pushing the bridge, and it kept pushing the bridge, and it kept pushing the bridge, and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. If I let Bill talk about this, you'll see that I'm not stopping. If I let Bill talk about this, he'll talk for the next hour about this, which is why I'm able to just push through, and Bill's going to talk to you about wine glasses instead. Uh, did, well, did you talk about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? No, I didn't. <laughs> so we can't afford to wreck a bridge, OK? Uh, so we're going to wreck a wine glass. So. 
What's that got to do with oscillation? Well, this is certainly something you can try at home. If you run your finger, you know, a wet, a wet, clean finger around the glass, you can get the glass to vibrate, okay? And it makes a kind of a ringing sound. I got close. I think some of you heard it. So that's the natural frequency of the glass, and the glass could almost be considered a tuning fork. Okay? We could try to get fancy technical devices to find out what that frequency was. We could get a trained musician to tell me what that frequency was, or we could try to find it physically. And so we've got a wine glass here. This is a horn driver from a rock music setup, you know, where they've got, it's a mid-range horn, so there's great big horns you see behind rock bands. This is the thing that drives it. It's good for about 200 watts, which is part of why we're using it, because we would like to, now please notice, it's not physically touching our volunteer glass, okay? Um, the glass is being held horizontally, look at that, see, and the audience is paying rapt attention. Um, so, um, we're going to send in a varying frequency. We have a signal generator here. So we're creating sine waves and sound, they're making the speaker change. I can do that cool science fiction stuff okay, and change the frequency. So the glass, when we get the resonant frequency, as Peter talked about, is going to pick up that energy and repeatedly add and add and add. We're not quite sure what frequency that is, so we can let it happen, but we know it's an acoustic frequency, and acoustic frequencies are all well above what our eye reports. We know that we can watch movies at 30 frames a second and we can't see the changes. One thirtieth of a second is too fast for an optical report. So we need a very sophisticated vibration detector. A ping pong Okay? So if we put the ping pong ball in there, and we... Okay, there we go. And we move that. And so now we can bring the noise up, bring the vibration rate down. For those of you who are young enough to still have high register, feel free to block them, that's fine. We won't be offended. vibrations a second, right? So let's bring it back, let's get it bouncing, and I'm going to move it just 10 vibrations a second up and down, okay? So I'm not going to change the volume, I'm only going to change the frequency. So let's go to 933. It's no quieter, but there's no vibration, right? Let's go down, we're back to 923. Now down to 9.13, almost nothing. That's what we mean by resonance. That's not volume dependent, that's frequency dependent. The glass, like a swing, think about it, if you're trying to get somebody to swing on a swing, if you push it the wrong time, you slow them down, don't you? You gotta be just at the right time. Okay, let's say we wanted to break this glass, just hypothetically. Um, <laughs> Is it good to have a ping pong ball in the glass? No, certainly not. Can you tell me why? Because you asked, right? No, no, I want physics. Why is a ping pong ball a problem? 
Should I just leave it in there and try? Okay, it dampens the energy. So if I'm moving a ping pong ball, I'm not moving a glass. You with me? So the ping pong ball would save the glass. Wait. Um, now, the glass is shaking a whole lot faster than you can see. One way to remedy that is with a strobe light. Now, if the strobe light blinks exactly as fast as the glass wiggles, it sits still, and that doesn't tell you anything. Right? And can you imagine strobe lights on, you see something, the thing moves, the strobe light turns off, so you don't see it move. It does its moving, it comes back because it's doing repeated motion, it comes back to where it was, strobe light comes on, you see it where it was. So you see nothing but the object in one place. So it looks like it's sitting still. Okay. Looks just like it does now. What if I slow the strobe light down a little bit? Just a little bit. And so I see the thing, the light goes off, the thing moves, it comes back to right where it was before, and the light doesn't come on. Because it's late, right? It's a little slow. So it goes a little bit further, and then the light comes on. And so I see it here, then I see it here, then I see it here, then I see it. So I see slow motion movement. And that's what we're going to do. And so this guy's vibrating at 923, and I'm going to run the strobe at about 920. Okay? So let's see what happens. Nothing? Do we have too much light? that actually represents where the failure happened. Yeah. So we had this 90 degree oscillation and we get a 90 degree cracking in the glass. Wow. So the glass itself maps out the motion that led to the failure. So this glass ended up breaking in part for the same reason a coat hanger breaks. If you bend it enough, you, you end up with... <laughs> If you bend it enough, you end up with fatigue at the bending point. Okay, and we end up snapping the glass and seeing the motion. Um, that's about. So it's about. I know we covered a lot of material here today, uh, but here's the thing: this was a bit less than one third of the material we have, which means that next year we will be doing the, an, another show about a completely separate topic with all new demonstrations. And the year after that, we're going to be doing another show with completely different demonstrations than the other two. Because physics has so much to talk about, and there are so many cool things that we do, and not a good opportunity to do them. So we invite people into our house so we can perform. Uh, 
But we really appreciate uh, that you took the time to sit through this, and hopefully you learned something. Uh, thanks for coming.